Welcome you to the third in our series of lectures pertaining to the Sacrament of Holy Orders. This evening, since our topic lends to that, uh, we will take our prayer from Don Henry Newman. Uh, many of us know uh, his journey into the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple of his prayers this evening, and possibly you know that uh, his cause is on the road in reference to sainthood. So let us pause for a moment uh, during this time of Lent as we recall the Lord's giftedness to each one of us, and we pray that the Lord may lead us as he has led many in the ways of his apostles. So let us pray. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home, lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. I was not ever thus, nor prayed that thou should lead me on. I love to choose and see my path, but now lead thou me on. I love the garish day in spite of fears. Pride ruled my will. Remember not past years. So long thy power has blessed me, sure it still will lead me on. Or moor and fen, or crag and torrent, till the night is gone. And when the morn those angel faces smile, which I have loved long since, and lost a while. John Henry Newman in his prayer likewise prays that he may know the light of truth. And as he says, O oh my God, I confess you can enlighten my darkness. I confess that you alone can. I wish my darkness to be enlightened. I do not know whether you will, but that you can, and that I wish are sufficient reasons for me to ask. I hereby promise that by your grace, which I am asking, I will embrace whatever I at length feel certain is the truth, if ever I come to be certain. And by your grace, I will guard against all self-deceit, which may lead me to take what nature would have, re would have rather than what reason proves. We pray this evening that the grace of John Henry Newman may likewise enlighten us this evening. Amen. 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 We are privileged this evening to have with us uh, Professor Clinton Brand. Professor Clinton Brand is Assistant Professor of English here at the University of St. Thomas. Um, we ask him to introduce our speaker this evening because I understand that he is a long-standing parishioner and a long-standing friend of Father Moore. So let us welcome Professor Clinton Brand. Thank you, Sister Grace. Uh, on the occasion of this, the third lecture in the 16th Annual Lenten Series, sponsored by Mrs. Margaret Coetzee and the Department of Theology at the University of St. Thomas, I have the great pleasure of saying a few words by way of introducing my parish priest, Father James T. Moore, pastor of the Church of Our Lady of Walsingham here in Houston. Lest I offend Father's habitual modesty, I promise to keep my remarks brief and to restrict myself to the recitation of a sampling of those accomplishments that make up a distinguished career in teaching, scholarship, and pastoral ministry, both as an Anglican clergyman and as a Catholic priest. A native Houstonian, James Tomlidge Moore was educated at the University of Houston and at the Episcopal Theological Seminary of the Southwest, where he received his Masters of Divinity in 1961. While serving as the Episcopalian chaplain at Texas a and University, Father Moore also pursued a master's and doctoral degree in history, with a specialization in North American colonial history. His dissertation on the North American martyrs and the Jesuit mission to the American Indians was published in 1982 by Loyola University Press under the title Indian and Jesuit, a 17th century encounter. After his conversion to Catholicism and while teaching at North Harris College, as well as visiting appointments at Texas A&M and St. Mary's Seminary, Father Moore also found time to research and write two books on the history of the Catholic Church in Texas. The first entitled Through Fire and Flood, The Catholic Church in Frontier, Texas, 1836 to 1900, was published in 1992. And the second, Acts of Faith, The Catholic Church in Texas, 1900 to 1950, was published in 2002. In addition to writing a number of essays, articles, and reviews, Father has also served as president of the Texas Catholic Historical Society. These academic accomplishments are impressive by themselves, 
but they are all that much more noteworthy for having been achieved in the midst of some 40 years of active Christian ministry. After his ordination as an Anglican priest in 1962, Reverend Moore served as the vicar of St. John's Episcopal Church in Sealy, Texas, and later as the vicar of the Church of St. Francis of Assisi in Prairie View. He also ministered as the Episcopalian chaplain of Prairie View A&M University, and then for nearly 10 years as the Episcopal chaplain at Texas A&M in College Station. He ended his association with the Episcopal Church in 1981, and then in 1992, James Moore, together with his wife and children, began the process of entering into full communion with the Catholic Church. Thanks to Pope John Paul II's pastoral provision, for the reception and ordination of married Anglican clergy in the Catholic Church. He was accepted as a candidate for holy orders and was ordained by Bishop John Murkowski to the Catholic priesthood in April of 1984. He was among the first of what would become, in time, more than 100 priests ordained under the auspices of the Holy Father's pastoral provision, which also established an Anglican usage of the Roman Rite. Father Moore was appointed to serve as pastor of the fledgling congregation of the Church of Our Lady of Walsingham, one of the first Anglican youth parishes in the Catholic Church in the United States. Under Father Moore's pastoral leadership, <coughs> together with the assistance over the years of Father James Ramsey, Father Bruce Noble, and Deacon James Barnett, Our Lady of Walsingham Catholic Church has grown and prospered. From the tiny band of Anglican converts who began meeting in people's homes and in wet, rented warehouse space, Our Lady of Walsingham Parish Church now claims several hundred families as members and comprises an extraordinarily dedicated community of faith. And just a few weeks ago, Bishop Fiorenza dedicated our splendid new church building, raised to the glory of God and consecrated in honor of His Holy Mother. In the Gospel reading for the Mass of Ordination, Christ commands Peter and through him all his successors in the ministerial priesthood. Feed my sheep. At the Church of Our Lady of Walsingham, the flock of souls pastored by Father Moore are richly fed. Grazing in the diligently tended pasture of grace, we are fed on the holy sacrifice of the Mass and all the sacraments celebrated with the utmost dignity and reverence. Shepherding our souls through the rhythms and rounds of the liturgical year, Father Moore undertakes through his homilies the ongoing spiritual formation and the continuing catechesis of his parishioners that we might be attuned more deeply to the work of sanctification in our personal and family lives. And we are reminded unceasingly by his words and by his witness of that great cloud of witnesses we have as our companions in the noble army of the saints and the martyrs. Joining the prayers of the church triumphant with the labor of the church militant Father Moore inspires us amid the hustle and bustle of parish life with the great example of his caring and composed prayerfulness. In all that he does, as a priest and as a pastor, he beckons, summons, and leads us on our individual and corporate journey to our heavenly homeland. Please help me in welcoming Father James Moore as he shares with us this evening his reflections on his own journey home to the fullness of the church. pleasure to be here with you this evening to share uh, some of my own reflections and experiences as I have sought to follow what I believe uh, and have believed is the right path. That's what we all try to do. Perhaps some of you have read uh, Eamon Duffy's book of 10 or 12 years ago entitled The Stripping of the Altars. It's the story of the uh, build up to and the carrying out of the English Reformation. And I think his book so aptly describes for us the struggles, uh, the milieu, out of which Anglicanism came. 
and developed into a body of contrasting views and factions that were often very uncomfortable with each other. It could be very confusing. As Flint pointed out, I was ordained in the Episcopal Church to the diaconate priesthood in 1961-1962. My wife, Linda, and I left the Anglican Church more than uh, 20 years ago now. Only one of our children even has a vague recollection of being anything but Catholic. And so we have had little or, or no first-hand experience of being within Anglicanism in a long time. And so the things that I will mention tonight about my reflections on Anglicanism and my experiences there have to do really with a long time ago. But I suppose uh, some of the things there would still be valid. Obviously, in our case, a long time ago, we came to the realization that we could no longer be a part of Anglicanism. Yet I would have to say, and this is only being just, I would have to say that for much of our experience of Anglicanism, before we reached that realization, for much of what we learned and knew, we continue to have much gratitude and respect It seems to me that most of the former Episcopalians I have ever known, who are now Catholics, always look back at Anglicanism that way, with very mixed emotions. You know, it's like, good heavens, I don't want to be there today. Thank the Lord I'm not there anymore. Yes, yes, there were things there, you know. That was the fruit, truly the fruit of good works. The fruit of good works, because Anglicanism has a rather strange thing about it. If you let it, it will teach you things that will finally take you out the door. <laughs> if you take it seriously, take it to heart, really believe it, then you'll finally leave it. <laughs> it's a strange thing, but it does seem to at least frequently happen that way. And so we, we look back on many things there with much gratitude and we have many tender memories there because much of the, what we learned there was truly Catholic or we wouldn't be Catholics today so it's it's an interesting it's an interesting act to look back at it all the Oxford movement of the 19th century is probably you know over many decades led to a steady stream, of course, if you look at the record, there was always a steady stream of converts to the Catholic Church from Anglicanism from day one. But certainly the Oxford movement led to an acceleration of that. The Oxford movement in some ways had kind of two wings, you know. Uh, one wing led to this constant stream of converts, and of course initially the, a number of the leaders of the Oxford movement became Catholic before the Oxford movement was even over with in the Church of England. Then there was that other wing that uh, sought to reshape Anglicanism. And in many ways, it had some real success for a time. Belief, a real belief in the power of the sacraments. There would be a real belief on the part of many Anglicans in the Eucharistic presence, the sacrifice of the Mass, all seven sacraments as channels of grace, prayers for the dead, um, the intercession of the Blessed Mother and the saints. A lot of that would result from the Oxford movement and in some areas of Anglicanism would be taken for granted as what Anglicanism taught. That would not be the case, of course, in every place. In my own memory, it was not difficult during the 1950s for a young person, or maybe I should say for a very naive young person, <laughs> such as I was, to believe that what the Oxford movement had accomplished, much of which I was able to take for granted, 
much of what the Oxford movement wanted to see at the heart of Anglicanism, that undoubtedly it would soon triumph. It would be years before I came to the realization that the goals of the Oxford movement never really could be realized in Anglicanism, that something was missing from the equation, and that was the all-important matter of authority, the authority to establish and maintain what the Oxford movement had sought. In spite of the steady flow of converts to the Catholic Church that would be produced by the Oxford movement that went on through the decades, we were talking about some of this earlier this evening, uh, that you would have uh, two religious orders in uh, the Episcopal Church in 1909 in Greenwald Garrison, New York, to uh, simply enter the Catholic Church. These converts sometimes were, in, in the case of some religious orders, virtually in mass, but then a steady stream would, would continue of individuals. As this went on, others <coughs> considered themselves children of the Oxford movement, believed that it was their task to remain in Anglicanism and practice what they considered to be the Catholic faith. And I think many of us believed that this would in some way bring about an eventual corporate reunion with the Holy See. And for a time, I would have to say, for a little while, in about a little after mid-century, in the early 60s, that really began to look like it just might begin to take shape. Maybe not to be realized in our lifetime, but on the horizon. And I'm sure there are many still around who can remember vibrant conversations in those times about just what might happen. But as the years passed, it became increasingly clear that Anglicanism, rather than growing closer to Rome, was being carried by secular and other forces in a different direction. So that whatever was left of the Oxford movement after a hundred years seemed to be losing ground rather than gaining it. And it had become a force incapable of molding Anglicanism any further. A new climate settled in which certainly by the early 1970s began to convince some that they could no longer in conscience remain where they were. By the late 70s, many were leaving the Episcopal Church uh, in, in wholesale numbers. Some left the Episcopal Church to form what came to be called, in the Anglican scheme of things, continuing churches. Others came to believe that for those shaped by the Oxford movement, the appropriate thing to do was to move in the same direction that others had moved in past decades. Yes, one could learn much that was good and true about the Catholic faith within the Anglicanism of that time, no doubt. But when a person comes to the realization that the Petrine authority is a real and indispensable <coughs> safeguard to the transmission of Catholic faith down the generations, well then, you could not remain within Anglicanism any longer. I remember an occasion about 27 years ago I was um, listening to a homily by a fellow Episcopalian priest. And he 
was probably pushing some cause I didn't like. <laughs> but be that as it may, he made the statement that given the polity of American Anglicanism, that the Episcopal Church itself could, for Episcopalians, change the canon of scripture. Well, I went away saying, that's absurd. That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. That's horrible. I don't know if my wife remembers it, but I came home that day complaining about it. I said, I've never heard such a thing in my life. I can't believe this was said. And then sometime in that afternoon, it hit me. The man was right. I was wrong because in its own understanding of its polity, polity, it could change the canon of scripture. I'm not saying they've done that exactly, but <laughs> they could. Because if you look at the canon of scripture as it is accepted, the statement is made that it was accepted by a vote of the General Convention of the Episcopal Church in 1789. Well, what if they voted against the Scripture? They would have something else. I mean, the man knew more about, he knew what he was talking about. I certainly didn't agree with him, but yeah, he was right on that question. And sometimes I look back and I think, well, when did I decide I had to be a Roman Catholic? Was there a certain day? I'm not saying it was exactly that day, but that certainly pushed me a long way uh, on that occasion. I do remember that one time I thought, wow, he was right this morning. I was wrong. You know, I was fuming, and I, in a way, we guess I should have, but on the other hand, he was right. By that understanding of things and the lack of authority, if the general convention of the Episcopal Church changed the canon of scripture, there is no authority that could cause them to rescind that. Well, that all began to unravel things for me. In the summer of 1978, and I mention this man because so much in his own person, he was a kind of a, I don't know, metaphor of what was left of the Oxford movement in the Episcopal Church by uh, the 70s. He was the Reverend Canon Albert J. Du Bois. He was quite a colorful figure in his day. He's long dead. He traveled the country the summer of 1978, speaking to interested Anglicans about the possibility of petitioning the Holy See for the reconciliation of Anglicans to the Catholic Church with the preservation of elements, some elements of Anglican liturgical tradition. I remember that summer well. Another priest and I met with him here in Houston on uh, July the 30th, as I recall. In his day, in Episcopalian circles, he was a very prominent individual. That doesn't mean everyone liked him. But he was quite well known. He was an ardent supporter of what was then called in the Episcopal Church the Anglo-Catholic position. And he was quite a, quite a babbler for it in that day and time. In early 1979, with the permission of Archbishop Fury in San Antonio, Canon Du Bois presided at a meeting there in that city at Casa Han of San Jose, a, a retreat center as I recall, presided at a meeting of Catholics and interested Anglicans from several states outside of Texas, and, and, and there were two there from Great Britain, as I recall, who were interested in pursuing the possibility of some kind of corporate reunion with the Holy See. The Archdiocese was, was very welcoming and were very gracious to us on that occasion. 
Later that same year, Canon Du Bois and others sponsored a symposium at the University of Dallas where contributors uh, discussed topics uh, that would later be addressed by the Holy Father's pastoral provision in 1980. Canada Du Bois by 1979 was quite old and he was approaching the end of his life. He was, uh, he was quite ill, as a matter of fact. And he had devoted his life in the Episcopal Church to furthering a Catholic understanding of the faith within Anglicanism. <coughs> he was a product himself of a diocese in the Episcopal Church that was founded in the in the actual days of the Oxford movement in the mid-19th century, the Diocese of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And over the years, uh, he had been very active in an organization that then existed and had existed for many decades. I don't think it exists anymore. It was called the American Church Union. It was the American branch of what they called in English circles uh, the um, English Church Union, or simply the Church Union. It was, it was a group that itself was founded at the time of the Oxford Movement and uh, was um, a group devoted to promoting a Catholic understanding of, of the faith within Anglicanism. And in 1950, Father Du Bois had become the executive uh, director of this organization. And for 25 years, he had led the group, and he published a newspaper. The organization published a newspaper. He wrote for it incessantly. You, you were either glad to get it, depending on your point of view in the Episcopal Church. You were either glad to see it in your mailbox, or you wanted to throw it away, because uh, you couldn't have a, I mean, there was no middle ground with Canada Du Bois. You either uh, went along with the Catholic interpretation of things, or didn't. And so he pleased many, and I suppose he irritated many as well. When he was past 70, he decided that it was time to leave the Episcopal Church. And he did so to try to lead a movement seeking some kind of corporate reunion with Rome. After the Dallas Symposium, late in the year 1979, Canon Du Bois would journey to Rome with a delegation which met with Franjo Cardinal Schaefer, who at that time, of course, was uh, the head of the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Cardinal Schaefer was very friendly to, to what they sought, <coughs> very courteous. On All Saints Day 1979, he allowed uh, Canon Du Bois to celebrate the 48th anniversary of his ordination to the Episcopalian priesthood, <coughs> at the altar of the American Martyrs at the North American College in Rome. <laughs> also on that occasion, the delegation signed a petition uh, to the Holy Father for something like a common identity for Anglican converts into the Catholic Church. This is an apocryphal story. I would like to believe that it's true. Cardinal Schaefer, it is said, presented the petition to the Holy Father. The Holy Father said to him, uh, I get um, so much bad news each day, it's nice to have some good news. So I hope it's a true story. <laughs> Simultaneous to Canon Du Bois' efforts, there were other Anglican groups really seeking the same thing about the same time. One such group made up of uh, a number of members of an organization of priests which still exists within Anglicanism known as the SSC, the Society of the Holy Cross. One such group um, would approach uh, the uh, United States Conference of Bishops in the late 1970s who in turn presented their concerns uh, to the Holy, Holy See. <coughs> Canon Du Bois uh, returned to the United States and in the very early part of 1980, he would make one uh, last trip uh, through the country speaking to interested groups of Anglicans. It used to be said that 
you would never get Cardinal, uh, excuse me, Canon Du Bois's message if you lived off of an Amtrak line because he didn't like to fly. So if Amtrak didn't stop in your town, you just missed the good news and got the pastoral provision. But he made uh, one final tour of certain places in the United States. Uh, reporting on his visit to Rome and his hopes for the future. Uh, he returned to his home in California and uh, died there in June of 1980, and the pastoral provision was announced uh, a few weeks later in August of, um, of 1980, the pastoral provision of Pope John Paul II. The Holy See at that time in 1980, appointed Bishop Bernard Law of Springfield, Cape Girardeau in Missouri as the ecclesiastical delegate for the pastoral provision and for its implementation. Um, and it should be pointed out that the pastoral provision, when it was announced, applied only to the United States. It doesn't apply to Canada, it doesn't apply to England, it applies only to the United States. And so Bishop Law, soon to be Cardinal Law, uh, would be uh, put in charge of its implementation. And he was given the title of ecclesiastical delegate. And of course, he is, as we know, no longer in Boston, but he does still maintain this position of ecclesiastical delegate. Cardinal Law and Father William Stetson, a priest of Opus Dei, would begin in 1981 and 1982 to implement uh, the pastoral provision by having meetings in several places, Catholic University for one, Holy Trinity Seminary in Dallas, with um, priests of the Anglican Church who wanted to um, enter the Catholic Church on the basis of this pastoral provision. What had to happen in the cases of these former Episcopalian priests, including myself, was that we had to go through an assessment process. And this actually began in 1981, in, in my case, and, and in the case of uh, Father James Ramsey, whom I'll mention in a moment. This actually began to take place at the, toward the end of 1981 with uh, a meeting at Holy Trinity in Dallas. And this assessment process would go on for um, about two years. And it was designed to um, have your education evaluated, be told what you needed to study, and you had to pass certain exams. For those Episcopalian priests who were married, their case, of course, had to go to Rome, in which case you usually were looking at a period of about a two-year wait, regardless of how much time it took uh, to complete uh, the rest of what you had to do. Dossiers were formed. Every priest had to do that. And these dossiers were presented to the local ordinary. The Holy Father had announced this provision, but he had not forced it on, on any ordinary. It would be totally up to the local ordinary if a former Anglican priest married or not would be ordained as a Catholic priest. And it would be up to the local ordinary if a congregation could be formed under this pastoral provision. Other meetings in the assessment process, of course, would follow in the months ahead. There was one in San Antonio in 1982 with Cardinal Law, and then beginning in 1983, the erection of parishes under this pastoral provision would begin. And the first one was the erection of Our Lady of the Atonement in San Antonio. It's, um, pastor was ordained a Catholic priest in August of 1980, and Archbishop Flores announced the formation of the parish as a Catholic <coughs> parish. Father Phillips later would travel to Rome as one of the co consultants in the presentation of a proposed Anglican usage of the Roman Rite uh, to authorities uh, at the Vatican. Several other parishes were erected in the following months, including our own, Our Lady of Walsingham, here in Houston, in April of 1984. Father James Ramsey and I 
were ordained on the same day at St. Cecilia's, April 7th, 1984. And on that occasion, Bishop Morkowski also announced the formal establishment of Our Lady of Walsingham as a parish in the Galveston-Houston Diocese. So this year, 2004, mark marks our parish's 20th anniversary as a Catholic church. Our community actually began its existence in March 1982. We were not yet Catholics. We were not exactly Episcopalians either. <laughs> a little hard to define what we were. <laughs> we were very sensitive about this too. <laughs> so we formed in about March of 1982. We met in each other's homes. And we continued to do this while Father Ramsey and I waited to find out if Bishop Morkowski would actually be willing for one of these pastoral provision parishes to exist within his diocese. Because if he had said no, well, that was that. <laughs> we approached him. I think, uh, I think I recall meeting with him on April 15th of 19. 82. And he was willing, obviously, or we wouldn't be talking about this tonight. He was willing and uh, kindly allowed us to meet in Catholic Church facilities. We didn't want to be viewed as some kind of fly-by-night group because we were seeking entrance into the Catholic Church. We were not trying to form some new division in the body of Christ, but uh, we were trying to Enter the Catholic Church, and so he understood that. We first met at Christ the Good Shepherd near Spring. We met there for about a year. Then we began to meet at St. Cecilia's, where Father Ramsey and I were ordained in 1984, and our community officially uh, formed into a Catholic parish. And then from 1984 to 1988, we met in an unused chapel at Duchenne Academy until the city, some of you may remember, until the city uh, plowed it under in the uh, Chimney Rock extension. Now, that was only a few days after we had said our last mass there, and we used to bemoan the fact that where the altar stood, you know, there was pavement, you know, today and so forth, but well, that had to be, I suppose. So uh, we were out of, a, out of a church for a while, but soon we rented space in an office warehouse complex, and we met there for about four years. Fortunately, with Bishop Fiorenza's permission, we were able to borrow enough money to purchase a portion of what is our present property. We were able to buy that in the first portion of it in 1989. And then in 1992, we completed our first building, and for the first time, in the 10 years of our existence as a community up to that time, we were able to celebrate Mass in something that we can think of as, as ours. The growth of our community has been steady over the years. By early 1999, it was apparent that we would have to enlarge our facilities in some way. On April 7th, back in 1984, when Bishop Morkowski had announced the formation of our parish, we became, at that time, the first Catholic parish in the United States to be placed under the patronage of the Blessed Mother with really a very old title, Our Lady of Walsingham. For those who may not know, the village of Walsingham, England, is a Marian shrine center today in our time. In 1061, Our Lady appeared there to a woman named Richelvis de Fabergé with the request that a small house shrine be built there as a center of devotion, especially centered around the Holy Family and the great miracle of the Incarnation. The small house that Richelvis was told to build was to be a reminder of the Holy Family's house at Nazareth. And this shrine did become, for several centuries, one of Europe's foremost Marian shrines. Beautiful churches and monasteries 
were built in the region of Walsingham in a certain area of Norfolk in England. Many of these buildings, of course, still stand. The original shrine, however, was destroyed in 1538 when Henry VIII outlawed religious orders and confiscated all the property that was in their keeping. In the 19th century, public Marian devotion was restored in the village of Walsingham by both Catholics and Anglicans. And today, uh, if you go to Walsingham, you will find actually three Marian shrines there. You will find a Catholic one, an Anglican one, and a Russian Orthodox one. <laughs> and it is said that even some of the local Methodists sometimes <laughs> participate in various shrine activities. When our community was formed in 1982, it somehow seemed only natural to all of us that as former Anglicans entering the Catholic Church, seeking to enter it under the pastoral provision, that, that grant by the Pope, that, that provision which itself seemed to us to be a gift from on high, that it seemed only natural to us then that we should place ourselves under the patronage of Our Lady of Walsingham. I didn't know when I went to see Bishop Morkowski on April the 15th, what he would think about this title for a Catholic community, since uh, there wasn't another one around with that title. But he was uh, quite positive. He knew all about Our Lady of Walsingham, probably more than I did. Uh, he may have even visited the shrine. I can't recall at this point, but he knew all about it. There was nothing I could have told him about it. And so he was quite happy uh, for us to have uh, this dedication. When we began to plan for a new church in 1999, we had just built an outdoor shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham. And so we likewise wanted the new structure in some way to reflect as much as possible a connection to our Lady of Walsingham and the shrine in uh, that English village. What Henry VIII destroyed, of course, disappeared long ago. There are some descriptions of it, and we do happen to know the exact size of it. Archaeological digs have verified this, and so we decided that in our new church, we would want to have, as near as possible, a replica of the Holy House Shrine. We knew the size, and we would have to go in faith <coughs> from there. And so one of the transepts in our new building is to that exact size. In fact, both transepts, of course, to make it balance, they both have to be that size. And one of these transepts is its own space and it's finished differently. It's finished in a medieval fashion on the inside. And it is the Marian uh, shrine, the Marian chapel, Lady Chapel. And we refer to it as the Holy House. And we hope thereby not, not just to show a connection with Walsingham, though we think that is important, but we particularly want to emphasize the Holy Family and families in general, uh, mothers, fathers, children, and of course the Incarnation. Jesus himself, the Incarnation of God, living in a family, in a little house. Our church um, was also designed to resemble the architecture of the Norfolk region of England. In fact, our architect, as part of his design preparation, went to the region and examined a number of churches, particularly uh, St. Peter's at Great Walsingham, which is about a mile away uh, from the actual shrine site. And so now in the United States, uh, we have the only Catholic Walsingham 
holy house <laughs> in the country. Um, our church was uh, just dedicated uh, three and a half weeks ago, and it was it was designed uh, in, in basic outline um, in a 14th century uh, Gothic fashion. <coughs> we use uh, modern building techniques and so forth, but uh, we were very pleased with it, and we think it turned out quite well. We were truly blessed in the year 2003 to be able to move into this church uh, toward the end of the year. And then another tremendous thing happened, at, at least in, in our scheme of things, and that was the publication of a fine edition of what is known as the Book of Divine Worship, that is our liturgical book, which the Holy See has approved. And it comes at such a providential time, this edition, uh, this nice edition of it, because there is obviously renewed interest on the part of many Episcopalians in entering the Catholic Church and in entering it through the pastoral provision. Our liturgical book contains, for instance, uh, the daily offices, the Psalter, um, the Rite for Mass. Uh, we have um, rites for baptism, funerals, weddings, and so forth that are uh, very, very much uh, like the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. There are some changes, of course. Um, the um, Holy See said back in the late 80s that they didn't wish to harm ecumenical relations with the Anglicans, and so they weren't going to make a judgment one way or the other on the validity of uh, the wording of the Anglican Eucharistic Canon. So they were telling us they weren't going to put the Anglican Eucharistic Canon in the Book of Divine Worship. But then what they did do was really amazing. Truly, this is a pastoral provision. The Vatican was very pastoral. They took a translation which Anglicans had made about a hundred years ago of the Roman canon. And it's in the language of the Book of Common Prayer, but it is the Roman canon, and that is what they put in uh, our right for the Eucharist. So we're very grateful for that. I also like to think that at Our Lady of Walsingham, we have always taken seriously the matter of vocations. A Deacon James Barnett, who is here, is a vocation which has come out of Our Lady of Walsingham, and he has served the parish as deacon uh, since 1987. Another original parishioner, Father Wayne Flagg, entered St. Mary's Seminary, uh, having been a layman at Our Lady of Walsingham, and he is now a priest in the Diocese of Victoria. And of course, if you count the two priests who came into the church, Father James Ramsey and I, uh, who came into the church when Walsingham was established, I guess you could say that uh, three priests have come out of Our Lady of Walsingham in the last uh, 20 years. Three priests, one deacon, and at the present time, another of our parishioners, Vic Pacheco, who is also here tonight, is a seminarian at uh, St. Mary's here in Houston, a seminarian for the Diocese of Galveston, Houston. Well, here we are in 2004. The pastoral provision is now 24 years old. It does still seem to have an attraction for some. In some ways, given the course of the world, the pastoral provision in some ways is a, is a very unlikely occurrence. So that I've always thought that surely one must see the hand of God in it. I think of discussions of long ago in the 70s about union with the Holy See. Such an occurrence, I suppose, to many of those in conversation at that time seemed unlikely, yet even then it did seem just possible. An occurrence which eventually to an extent would take place, and I think the pastoral provision still stands as an occurrence which in the providence of God might yet prove a model for the reunion of others in far greater number 
than we ourselves, the reunion of others with the Sea of Peter. Thank you. to mind and that their, the basic argument would have been where I would <coughs> it was just that I mean I, I it's hard to remember at this point because my first year in um, I my first year in seminary was where when the first word of a possible council was because Pope Pius XII died in the fall of 58 and that was my first semester in seminary. And I think before spring was over, there had been some 
rumor, at least, that Pope John XXIII might call a council. And so everyone was kind of talking about that and what that might mean. Um, other than that, uh, Yes. I know when David and I converted to the Catholic Church, his mother, who of course was the secretary of the Adventist, yes. was very concerned about it because of two reasons, and both were myths or fallacies. One was she was upset about the fallibility of the Pope, not understanding that the Pope can speak with infallibility. She she found it hard to believe that any human being could be infallible, so I think that was a misunderstanding of that. And the second was, in spite of their chapel to Our Lady of Walsingham, she was very concerned that we would be worshiping Mary. And so those were her two arguments. Well, I, the infallibility of the Pope, yes, that would have been, uh, that would have been thrown up as a barrier to becoming Catholic, I can recall. Uh, I got over that one pretty easily, though, I have to say. I didn't get into all of that. But I decided um, that I could take the, uh, that the Pope in Rome, I decided this as an Episcopalian. He had a lot more reason to be infallible than the general convention of the Episcopal. <laughs> <laughs> so, I could see the Pope doing that more than I could that. Yes, ma'am. With the uh, conversion of 2000. Anglican priest in, in England and the conversion of Graham Leonard, the Bishop of London, has that left the Anglican movement uh, in England, the, the high church, I guess you would call it, sort of vacated and yes. now it's all the evangelical yes. <coughs> or Anglican. It's not even that anymore. It's <laughs> very secular. Very secular minded. Um, Yes, the, the Anglo-Catholic movement, I mean, you find, I'm told, some parishes that still uh, try to maintain these traditions, but it, it basically is a has-been movement by now. now. I sense this was already happening in the 70s, and, and so I would just have to assume that 25 years later <coughs> that, it, that it really has. I mean, you no longer have some of the organizations that once existed, though. So there was a, a fine old organization called the Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament, and I understand they still exist. I and there is there is still in the American Episcopal Church a society, and they have I understand a chapter in this city, a, a, a chapter of the Society of the Living Rosary of Our Lady and Saint Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an Episcopal group. I'm sorry? Which is an Anglican group. Yes. 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 How about in uh, recent times of the uh, Episcopal Church, uh, the, uh, the question is uh, uh, why why a male uh, priesthood? Why do they why do they well, not? Why, why Catholics? Why Catholics? why Catholics have a male priesthood? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> Because the Pope says we have to have a male priesthood. <laughs> I mean, there are other reasons, but that's <laughs> that's the final one. It's it's not in uh, Catholic tradition, and um, the Pope hasn't allowed it. How else do I answer that? You know the uh, the Jewish uh, the Jewish uh, religion it, 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 it is uh, kind of unique. Uh, all the religions, uh, the nations around the Jewish religion, they were polytheistic, and the Jews were monotheistic. Um, the other religions seem to get into uh, human sacrifice. In Jewish religion, they were forbidden not to do it. So there, there's a lot of uh, remarkable things about the uh, Jewish tradition, but I'm just kind of working it through my mind. Mm -hmm. Yes. I got a question. Uh, 
The Anglican Church is about 400 and some years old. At the time of the Reformation, about 450. So about 450. Like yeah. If we take uh, from the time of the establishment of the Anglican Church, which came from the Catholic Church until the present time, and we go back to the history of the Catholic Church, or the Christian Church, I'm going to call it, from the time of the Council of Jerusalem, and take 450 years from that day, wasn't there a tremendous amount of intellectual ferment in heresies and everything else in the church at that time? Over those 450 years, all the councils are trying to figure out the Trinity, the, the nature of Christ, all these other things that go into it. Wouldn't the Anglican Church be going through the same kind of, a, of an evolution and metamorphosis? Because even at that time in the Christian Church, you did not have very much authority on the part of the Pope, as evidenced from the uh, First the Council of Jerusalem. That was a development too. Well, I see what you're saying, but you said the Christian Church. Yeah. You're speaking of the Universal Catholic Church? The Universal Church, yeah, which includes the Orthodox Church and, and the First The Episcopal Church is not the Universal Church. So I don't see how we can compare what it's going through to what the body of the faithful went through 18 centuries ago. I mean, if you want... See, here's a problem. You know, the, 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 the matter of women priests was mentioned. Anglicanism decided to do that in the 1970s. Well, can a woman be a priest or not? Well, the General Convention of the Episcopal Church said yes. Well, that didn't carry much weight with me. If the Pope in Rome said yes, that would carry weight with me. Because you have to look at Christian tradition, Catholic tradition. It is the tradition of one body. Not, it's not supposed to be the tradition of 450 different denominations. And so what is Christian tradition? And so that's why I answered the question. We don't have women priests because the Pope said we don't have women priests. Well, of course. I mean, it's also out of our tradition. We don't do that. But if the Pope said do it, well, then there might be a reason to do it, you see. But if a, if a convention of a province, I mean, says do it, well, that's schism, you see. That's all it can be. And I don't see how you can compare the foment that goes on in a certain section of the church with what the universal church was going through in its, in its first thousand years. Do you have any inside information about possible uh, new movement in the Episcopal Church based on the installation of the bishop this past weekend? I don't have any insight. <laughs> <laughs> Calling you and asking you how do you go about this? <laughs> <laughs> um, what a well, I mean the pastoral provision is still on the books, and yes, there are people trying to take advantage of it. As far as something new, um, well, some things have happened, uh, but I only know what I. You can read it on EWTN's news service, or I mean, or the, or the Zenith news service. It's not something I you know, know through some contact. But, I mean, are, are you, do you personally get calls from Episcopal? Uh, yes. And we're interested in. Mm -hmm. And where is Father Ramsey today? It's the St. Michael's Needville. Yes. At what point did Anglican orders? Cease being valid. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> well, Leo the Thirteenth in Apostolic Curie in 1896. I'm trying to remember it now, but I, I believe he would have said that Anglican orders remained valid until a new ordinal was put into effect in 15. 52. Um, after that time, Leo XIII said that you could not detect the mind of the Church as being the Church of England as being to ordain what a Catholic would consider a priest. 
Now, on that question, and I realize some of this may sound ludicrous, but um, years ago, when I was a seminarian in the Episcopal Church, we would um, sit up late researching what our lineage would be once we were ordained. Because there were some Catholic authorities who said, and they were not going against uh, Leo XIII at all, they said, oh, absolutely right. But since that time, and it was true that Anglican order, or the language of Anglican orders was, had been changed since what Leo XIII had condemned. But the lineage, of course, had been broken. But since um, certain Orthodox and old Catholic bishops had participated in Anglican ordinations since 1896, then you see it might be possible that even if Leo XIII were right, you might end up somehow with valid orders. <laughs> some responsibility in Anglicanism to bring it home. Uh, so I, I didn't have to convince myself that there was something valid about Roman Catholicism. To me, that was, I guess, always obvious, even as an Anglican. That may sound kind of, you know, like we were a little schizoid or something. <laughs> I guess we were. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm a convert from uh, St. Thomas Episcopal not too long ago, uh, the founding uh, uh, minister of that church was a fellow named P. Robert Ingram. Yes, I remember him. He wrote a treatise. Uh, he didn't require the parishioners to read it, but he wrote a treatise answering Newman and saying why uh, Newman was wrong, that Newman got it wrong, he shouldn't have converted. Yeah. Did you ever did you ever discuss that with him? At no. All? Did you ever hear that? <laughs> Well, obviously, there must have been a time in my life when I thought Newman was wrong, too. Yeah, but, uh, he, he set it out, and it appeared in the Texas Churchman, which is the, the diocese. Well, I probably saw it at the time, but I, but I really actually don't remember it. And uh, it, it, it didn't make the circulation very long because uh, some, somebody objected. They thought it was, it, it was and he had a very fine mind, and it would have, oh, yeah. uh, uh, you still could have come, you still could have been a Catholic at the reading. <laughs> I mean, he I don't remember what the arguments were now. It's been a long time. Yeah. But uh, another observation, I don't know if this is, there are a number of converts out of St. Thomas Episcopal, but they all go to Holy Rosary and Annunciation. Why don't we come to your church? Why didn't we? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Why you have every canonical right to. I do. That's why it was set up. Please come. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You would be very welcome. Absolutely. Yes, this is the question I wanted to ask. Uh, what, uh, what is the attitude of the authorities of the Latin Rite to the, uh, recept the celebration of liturgy in your church by those who have never been at it? <coughs> who have, like, you know, well, it, it's kind of impossible to, um, canon law says that any Catholic church fulfills the Sunday Mass obligation, and I don't know of any way you could prevent that. What was the question? 
What, what, what was the, the attitude toward uh, Catholics who had never been Anglican coming to the masses in Our Lady of Walsingham? Well, a little bit beyond that, really. Uh, I mean, many of us thought that uh, at least the language of the Book of Common Prayer was vastly superior to anything the ICEL had done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sensibility or an appreciation. I mean, there's never any question about that. And of course, many Anglicans used to be that way. I mean, uh, they, uh, in fact, there were Anglican priests in my childhood who, who said, you know, if you go to a town and there's, uh, you can't receive, but uh, if you go to a town and there's no uh, Episcopal church, then you were to go to the Catholic church, not to the Methodist or the now, I'm not saying all of his companion priests said that, but there were those who did, and, because uh, that was valid. <laughs> Father, can, I, can I answer the Father's question? Because I think yes. I understood it. My husband and I met in an Episcopal church and, and married as Episcopalians. When we had children, we converted to Catholicism. We went to a... a traditional Catholic Church for 20 years and our children were not familiar with the liturgy that we use at Our Lady of Walsingham and they had a very difficult time adjusting to it. They'd go, oh, this isn't really Catholic because the language is so formal and so beautiful and they weren't used to that. <laughs> also, and, 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 and please forgive me for saying this, but when we go up for communion, we were, we're very reverent and we kneel and it's not what I call the jack-in-the-box drive-through line at communion, uh, which I have a very difficult time with now when I, when I go to other churches for funerals or, or weddings or other things. And we have invited some of our friends to come from other churches to, to visit our church. And they, they have a difficult time uh, saying, well, well, we just can't keep up with this liturgy. You know, because, but I found my mother's missile that she carried when she got married to my father in the Roman Catholic Church in 1946, and it is in Latin on the left-hand page, and on the right-hand page, the English transition, the English translation, excuse me, is exactly the liturgy that we use in our church. That, that's why we go to the Annunciation at 8 o'clock. Right. <laughs> I showed my son my mother's missile, had the Latin on one side and the English translation on the other side, and he saw that it was, then he, then he finally believed that Our Lady of Walsingham was a Catholic church. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us this evening. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday.